So uh, next up will be Howard. Um, besides being uh, the chief architect of the Open LDAP project, he's also an accomplished magi magician. Um, uh, your band Highland Sun still active? Yeah, here and there. Here We've and there? Played parties, concerts. And, uh, and you, you can actually buy his CD on, on Amazon still, on I Amazon. think. Amazon.com, that's right. <laughs> Um, so H Howard's been involved in, in the directory space for a long, long time, uh, starting before his uh, involvement e in Open LDAP. Even uh, he's now uh, running the show at OpenLDAP.org and uh, doing a lot of work in a lot of interesting areas. So this talk will be about uh, his new work on memory mapped uh, databases and. Uh, Here's Howard. Thank you, Kurt. All right, so MDB. This is um, both a database library, a standalone library, as well as a SLAPD backend. First, a little bit about the OpenLDAP project. You know, I've used this slide for the past six years, so you've probably seen it already. If you don't know the OpenLDAP project, just go to openldap.org. You can see everything you need to know. This slide I've also used for quite a long time. Um, my company, Simus Corporation, was founded in 1999. Our original mission was actually uh, enterprise user and resource management. And uh, we s somehow discovered that building this project on top of LDAP was, was great and all, but people were having enough trouble with LDAP itself that we got more business just supporting LDAP than, than doing identity management and resource management on top of that. Okay. Um, mostly this presentation will follow the same path as my paper, so if you've read the paper, you have an idea of where we're going. Now, OpenLDAP has actually been doing pretty well for the past several years. Um, it's been delivering very reliable, very high-performance service. Uh, but we get a lot of complaints still. Performance comes at the cost of fairly complex tuning. And if you look under the covers, the code is really not as clean as it could be. It's not what it should be. If you go into this and say, oh, let's clean this up, you find that you can't just clean up the back-end code. You also need to look at what's under the back-end, the low-level database. Uh, and that's, that's a fair, fairly uh, large amount of work, but I think doing the work is well worthwhile. So more background. Uh, OpenLDAP has been using Berkeley DB, gosh, since we first started working on the back BDB back end in 2001, and the first public release was 2002, which kind of corresponds with um, when Netscape actually went to Sleepy Cat and asked them to produce Berkeley DB version 2.0. That was just around the 2000-2001 time frame. And it's evolved over the years um, between uh, the initial creation of that uh, code base, uh, we've profiled it intensely, benchmarked it intensely, and you know, improved things here and there. It's been the world's fast, fastest LDAP directory for a number of years. We have many large corporate clients who, uh, <laughs> who have bought support contracts from us in 2005 that have yet to log a trouble ticket with us, so we're doing pretty well with that. But there is a downside. They've always required careful tuning. Um, the data that the, the server serves up comes through three levels of caches. You know, there's the OS, the file system cache. Berkeley DB has its own page cache. And then uh, the back end has its own entry caches, DN caches, index caches. Each of these cache layers has a completely different set of characteristics. You know, the, uh, the file system cache is operating on one page level. The database cache is page-based, but it's using a different page size. And then the, the back-end cache is doing you know, decoded entries, which are, again, larger than 
the original page cache, uh, but they're also faster. So when you want to get the maximum performance out of this server, you can't just say set this one cache to a particular number because it won't be right. You know, you've got to balance this against this against that, and it's pretty complicated. And we couldn't just uh, do away with one of these levels because uh, when we were first testing uh, the back BDB code, we found the, the code was just too slow without some level of caching on top. So we were kind of forced into that direction. Of course, BackBDB was originally developed with no backend caching. And, um, you know, it looked like pretty nice, straightforward code. Uh, and then we said, oh gosh, but we got to put this cache on top. And suddenly things got very complicated and um, a lot uglier. We also found that these caches were not always helping us. Sometimes they were hurting pretty badly. First of all, the data could exist in three different places at once, so we weren't making good use of memory in the system. Uh, secondly, uh, searches with result sets that were larger than your configured cache would basically churn the cache into uselessness. You know, the cache effectiveness would drop to zero. Also, uh, when you're adding entries and deleting entries from the cache very frequently, uh, it turns, uh, turns out that it triggers massive heap fragmentation and like the default memory allocator in libc was terrible with this. You know, your process size would just uh, grow extremely fast and it would completely defeat the purpose of setting a small cache size in the first place. You know, the process size would go way beyond the size you configured. So overall, um, backends just required too much attention, too much care and feeding. All right, so what's the obvious thing to do? This cache stuff really sucks. Let's get rid of it. And uh, the caching causes all these locking problems for us. Let's not do any locking either. Let's just throw that all away. So how do we do this? You know, we're, we're talking about just relying solely on the file system caching now. And we're going to use multi-version concurrency control. And the basic idea there allows readers to run without any database level locks. Interestingly enough, you know, the Berkeley database library has supported multi-version con uh, concurrency control for several years uh, since version 4.5. But uh, when we first looked at that, we realized we can't actually get any benefit out of it because it still requires us to do our own cache management. And once, we ha once we're stuck with our own cache management, uh, all the other problems remain. We still have to do our own locking. So really, to, to make any progress and get the results that we want, we have to move away from Berkeley DB. And upon realizing this, you know, I started looking around, you know, what, what else is out there that we could po uh, possibly use for our benefit? You know, CouchDB or some of these other uh, large-scale distributed databases. Um, things like CouchDB are written in Java, so it's, <laughs> it's a non-starter for, for a C project. So anyways, um, the, the conclusion was, well, we're going to have to write our own. So that's, that's where we are with uh, the MDB library. It's based on the idea of a single level store, which is actually an extremely old idea. Uh, it's older than me. Uh, first implemented in Multics. And the concept is simple. You, know, you treat all of system memory as a, a single address space, regardless of whether it's RAM or disk. It's all one thing. And so for us, we're going to use a database and we're going to access the entire database simply by mapping the database into the address space. The other um, factor going into this is uh, instead of making copies of data from the database to return to the application level, we just give you a pointer straight into the memory map. So there's no memory copies happening anywhere. Now, this is a great idea, but <laughs> it only works if you actually have a process address space that's large enough. You know, when single level store was first invented, um, computer memory spaces were on the order of 512 kilobytes. And um, you know, for 32-bit processors, that was large back then. 
so you start, if you look back through computer history, you'll see that this idea kind of faded out right around the mid-1980s, early 1990s. That's just when you know, data volumes started to get close enough to two gigabytes that you couldn't use this anymore on a 32-bit processor. So really this idea is only viable for us today because we have cheap commodity 64-bit CPUs. And um, for the moment, they're large enough to encompass most of the database sizes we're interested in. I don't think I'm going to live to see someone create an 8 exabyte database. I don't believe it. <laughs> All right, so MDB. We use a memory map of the database, and in this case, the memory map is read-only. Um, the main reason we do this is just for safety. Uh, with a, a read-only map, you can't corrupt the database structure with a random write from buggy code. Not that we have buggy code, but... <laughs> Okay, so any, any attempts to write to the map immediately cause a segmentation violation. So if you happen to have bugs in your code, you'll find out right away. The other thing is there's actually no point in making the pages writable because uh, you, can only use, you can only use that write access to modify existing data pages. You can't uh, add new pages to the end of a file. You can't grow a database file using a memory map. So you always need to use file system operations uh, just to grow the database. So just for uniformity, we'll just make all IOs, all database accesses work the same way. They all use write ops. So for MVCC, uh, obviously we can't write things in place, so we're going to do a copy on write operation. So any, any active data in the database is never overwritten. It just stays there. We make a copy of whatever we're going to work with, modify the copy, and then save the copy into a new page. Now, since we're doing copy on write and we never alter existing data, that means that the database structure can never be corrupted by any of our operations. And this gives us a, an interesting benefit that we don't need write-ahead transaction logs. And transaction logs are one of those big administrative headaches that a lot of us dealt with with Berkeley DB. So getting rid of those was kind of nice. The other thing with MVCC is readers always see a consistent view of the database. They're completely isolated from writers because they, you know, they come in, they see a version of the database, and that version is live for the entire uh, duration of the read operation. And since uh, nothing else can alter the map that the reader is looking at, Readers don't need any locks. If you look at around, there's, there's actually many other MVCC database implementations out there. Um, but uh, doing full MVCC can be extremely intensive uh, for compute resources. Uh, typically, an MVCC database will store a complete history from the beginning of time to the present time. Uh, and since they generally work by just writing new data, never rewriting old data, the, the volume, the size of the database files grows extremely fast. You know, every operation you do just keeps on uh, growing. So the database files can grow without bound unless you take extra steps to, to prune it. And pruning can also be <laughs> an extremely intensive operation. Uh, using garbage collection or some kind of copying compaction process it requires that your system has uh, huge amounts of spare CPU and I.O. resources. Because if you have your server operating at a target write load, you know, 5,000 writes per second, that means it's generating new data and, and your garbage collector has to be able to process all of the old data and the incoming data at faster than 5,000 writes per second. Otherwise, it will never catch up. So you've got to have an extremely fast machine way over provisioned for the actual workload that you wanted to target. Uh, another thing, if you're going to do this kind of garbage collection, you, you need to know what data is in use and what data is idle. Um, you, you, know, you can't garbage collect away something that someone's actually using. And a lot of the normal mechanisms for tracking and use status uh, involve locks. 
uh, reference counters that need to be locked or updated atomically. So there's a lot of there's a lot of problems that go into MVCC, even though it sounds really great when you first hear about it. So for Open LDAP, we actually don't need everything that a normal MVCC system would use. You know, we don't care about every historical revision of a database. You know, we only care that the current version that we're looking at is, is valid, and um, that's it. You know. So the MDB library only maintains two versions, the last committed one and the one previous. Uh, older versions can actually be held for a little bit longer if there's an active reader that's keeping it in use. The other thing we do is uh, we maintain an explicit free list of uh, all of the recently freed pages so that we can reuse them directly. And we don't use any locks to maintain this uh, in use status. I love this slide. It's, uh, I think it's delicious irony that the code I'm using started from uh, LDAPD which uh, Martin Hedenfalk in the OpenBSD project's been writing. Because the reason he started writing LDAPD is because he didn't like Open LDAP. But anyway, so I took his code and I stripped out all the parts that I didn't like and uh, added a couple pieces that I needed. Uh, his, the original code uh, is append only, so it grows, grows very fast. And so I changed it to use our page reclaiming mechanism. Also, uh, the original code was just a very simple B-tree implementation, and just for my own comfort, I wanted to add a lot of features that Berkeley DB provides for us that we've been using for a long time in back BDB. So the code has changed quite a bit from the original. This code is very small. Um, the object code is under 32 kilobytes on a x86-64. It fits entirely within a CPU's level one cache. Um, compare that to the Berkeley DB library, which does lots of things that we never wanted it to do in the first place. You can see that you know, writing our own database library is something we probably should have done a long time ago. Okay, just, uh, just to give you an idea of how things are, we're working and what we've looked at this very quickly uh, a view of how a B-tree database operates. Um, they're all page-based. Uh, every database page typically has a header that says what page number it is, might have a couple miscellaneous flags, and then um, specific types of pages, the meta page and the data page. The meta page is very important. It tells you the page number of the root of the tree. So without that, you don't have any data. And then in a, in a data page, it'll generally have an array of offsets to where the data begins. And the data usually will begin by filling in from the end of the page forward. So the key data pairs at the bottom of the page and they work their way upwards and the offsets are at the top of the page and they work right downwards. When they meet in the middle, the page is full and you gotta use a new page. So here's an example of a generic B-tree library that uses a write ahead transaction log. You start with just a file with a meta page that doesn't point to anything. And you say, okay, I'm gonna add this key data pair, one comma foo. So suddenly you create this data page, you update the root pointer, and off you go. Then you do a commit. Say, all right, this is all done. Now if the uh, system crashes in between one of those two points, then that operation disappears. Okay, so we'll add another data item. Goes on the same page. Nothing else changes. And then one other thing that normally happens, we do a checkpoint. For instance, in Berkeley DB, all of your database operations actually are only done in the Berkeley DB cache. The only thing that goes to disk is the write ahead log. When you do a checkpoint, you actually flush all of the cache onto disk. And so at that point you're making flushing every copy of what you've got back to disk. So that's, that's kind of where we were with Berkeley DB. 
and this was uh, something that I looked at originally, the append-only uh, code, which, which I got from Martin Hedenthal. You start with, again, an empty database, just one meta page, points to nothing. Create some data, nothing points to it yet. So you write a new meta page, you just write it at the end. Everything is appended to the end of the file. Once you've written the new meta page, the old meta page is no longer useful. It's just ignored. And we'll, okay, we'll write a second record here, and we need to write another meta page on our commit. So once we've written that, the previous meta pages and data pages are invalid. And so this goes on and on. If I write another data page, I commit with another meta page, write new data, commit. And you can see that over the course of time, these these database files grow huge, even though they only contain small amounts of live data. So with MDB, uh, we actually use two meta pages and ping pong between them. So we write our first data record. We do a commit. We say, OK, we committed on transaction number one, and uh, our data root points at page number two. So this is another thing. We're, I'm using two meta pages, and in each meta page, I'm using two root pointers. One of them points to the data, and one of them points to my free list. So at this point, there is no free list because nothing's been reused yet. Writing a new data record. Now, I actually have something to, to put in the free list as well. So the free list here says that on transaction number two, I uh, invalidated data page number two. And then I do a commit. Write some new data. Write a new free list. And again, another commit. Now, once I've committed this, uh, the previous pointer to uh, transaction number one is gone. And the only thing that pointed at page number two is gone. So page number two is now idle. If I add new data, it'll reuse page number two. And then if I do a commit at that point uh, with a new free list, it just overwrites the next meta page. So that's the basic idea. With, with this approach, we get most of the benefits of MVCC, but we don't get a database that grows without bound. It just, it's pretty tightly controlled space. All right. So the backend code, is basically the same code we used in back BDB and back HDB. I mean, I literally copied the source tree, deleted a whole bunch of stuff, and uh, changed a few uh, symbols and defines to match. I basically did a global replace of capital BDB to capital MDB. So. But uh, you can see the source code is over 30% smaller. Um, and all of the same features are there. Now, there were a couple of trade-offs in, in taking this route. Um, by eliminating caching of every sort, that means we, we pay a cost to decode entries on every request. And our lesson from the early days of back BDB was uh, decoding entries was very expensive. Um, it was on the order of you know, a millisecond per entry back, back in the mists of time. But uh, we'll say, well, you know, we hadn't really explored all the op uh, options for optimizing that yet. So no problem. We'll just make entry decoding faster. And in fact, in the current uh, back MDB, it's still based on the same encoder and decoder that BDB used. But it's been tweaked a little bit. It's about seven times faster than the old one. And uh, at this point, the runtime is, is pretty much invisible. Uh, the copy on write approach that we use in the library only allows a single writer at a time. And this actually has a very visible impact. Um, BDB allows multiple concurrent writers. Uh, it has pretty high thru uh, write throughput, and MDB has much slower write throughput. Okay. Now, if you've read the paper, there's a bunch of performance results in there. Some of those results are already invalid because I was bored between writing the paper and flying to here <laughs> and change some of the code some more. Uh, also, 
um, like in the paper I wrote, well, BackMDB doesn't support multi-threaded slap add yet, and now it does, so I had to add some new test results to that. Okay, so here's a comparison of the time that it takes to load 5 million entries using our original back HDB code and using our MDB code. The top set of lines is for back HDB with a single thread. That's the normal case. Now, in fact, that's a little bit misleading because back HDB always uses a background thread to do trickle syncs. So it will flush dirty pages to disk in the background while Slapad is running. That's why you see that the total CPU time for user time is actually greater than wall clock time. So the orange line is user time, the blue line is wall clock time. And really, the, the blue, the real time, is what we would be concerned with as administrators or users, right? Um, then the next line, HDB double, this is a feature that I just added a couple of days ago where we, we pipeline slap add so that the reader and the writer are in two separate threads and they can run concurrently. And that saves you know, a pretty good amount of time off of that. Um, then the next line, HDB multi, that's with multi-threaded indexing, which is a feature that has uh, been in there since uh, early 2.4. And it turns out it, <laughs> it actually doesn't work very well because there's so much overhead in our thread synchronization. Um, so you, you can see that the multi-threaded indexer is actually running you know, two seconds slower than, actually two minutes slower than the single-threaded uh, case. Uh, so that turns out to be a loss. Then with MDB, you see we're in the range of twice as fast using much less CPU time. Uh, the system CPU time is higher for MDB, and this, this is one of the, the main differences in how we do writes. In Berkeley DB, the only thing that gets written to disk is a log, is a transaction log. In MDB, every data write actually has to go through a, a, an OS write system call, and so that imposes a lot of uh, system CPU time. On the right side, uh, right side of this graph, you see the, the size of the resulting database. This is with the same 5 million entry LDIF file in, in both cases. Uh, so you see we're packing data a lot more efficiently in MDB than Berkeley DB is. Um, and more importantly, on the left side, uh, the size of the SLAPD process when you have accessed the entire database once. You can see uh, in the paper, you know, the MDB side was 12.8 gigabytes, and now we're down to 6.7 gigs. So where originally I was expecting that we would be using one-third as much memory as Berkeley, we're now using around one-quarter of the memory. So after I've loaded all these databases, the first thing that I'm interested in seeing is how fast can we read the data? And again, the, the blue columns there are for Berkeley with HDB and the orange columns are MDB. I guess you can't really call them columns. They're more like you know, pedestals. Um, the very first column shows the initial search after the SLAPD process was just started cold. So for Berkeley DB, that's four minutes, 15.4 seconds. And for MDB, it's 12.47 uh, seconds. So this, this shows you the magnitude of difference between uh, Berkeley DB data fetch speed and MDB data fetch speed. The next column over is the second search. So the second search is on the process after, you know, immediately after the first search is completed. So that just eliminates all of the database level access time and reflects only the back HDB entry cache speed. So you can see even though back HDB is running entirely in RAM, has no work to do other than to find an entry and return it, it's actually slower than MDB, which has to go out, search the database for your records and return it, and decode it at each point. So um, 
that kind of shows you how inefficient the Berkeley-based backend was. Um, now, the, the next couple of columns just shows uh, how, how the database reacts when we start throwing concurrent searches at it. And each one of these searches is just a single search on an unfiltered attribute, scans the entire database, and reads it all into memory. Um, so with two concurrent searches, you see that uh, the, the Berkeley-based code is faster, but it doesn't scale linearly. It's, you know, it's 50% slower than it should be. And then we go up to four, and then eight, and then 16, and you see that it just blows up. The, the system I'm working with has 16 cores, so that's as high as I could go. But you can see that um, the locking systems that we've been using in back HDB just don't scale well to large numbers of CPUs. And uh, I didn't have data like this in prior years uh, because the largest machine I could test on only had eight CPUs. So this, is, this was kind of new information for me. Uh, but you can also see that uh, back MDB, which does no read locking, has no problem scaling completely linearly across any number of CPUs. Um, so this, this is just simple results with a bunch of LDAP searches running concurrently. This is more interesting. This is a, a heavy load generated by SLAMD. Um, you can see, again, the first column is back HDB. And the number that back HDB is returning there is actually a very good result. It's like 67,000 searches per second, which um, was the fastest performance we've ever seen on this test machine as of you know a month ago. But um, it's just completely blown away by back MDB. And the other one and other two, um, I actually can tell you that other one is OpenDS 2.3. <laughs> I can't tell you what, what other two is, but but um, these were the two other fastest servers I could get my hands on, and I've tested all of them. Everything else would wouldn't even show up on this graph, so that's kind of where we're where we are in terms of performance. But here you see the uh, the other side of things. Uh, our modify rate is uh, ridiculously slow. That's um, 22,000 writes per second for Berkeley and about 6,100 a second for MDB. And then running a search rate and a modify rate concurrently, you see, again, the, the balance is, is strongly tilted towards searches. So, I think this is a pretty good result for us because with MDB, we don't have to do all the complex cache tuning anymore. In fact, you know, there's no cache tuning, there's no uh, maintenance required, there's no cleanup, garbage collection, transaction log deletion, whatever. Um, so, it makes life easier for administrators. I think it's going to make life easier for us as developers because there's the code is, is tiny, it's you know, extremely heavily documented, um, and the efficiency is just, uh, well, I believe the efficiency is where it was supposed to be from the beginning. Now, I talked about, um, you know, building this MVCC approach that uh, didn't have to do all the full stuff that full MVCC does. It only had to do what we needed for Open LDAP. But it, it isn't just a one-off solution. You know, um, it, it took a matter of hours to port it to Windows and Mac OS X. Uh, it's running on Android. I have it running on my phone right now. Um, and also, you know, it's uh, just just as a proof of concept for myself. Uh, it's I ported it to some other code bases as well. Um, if you go onto Gitorius, you can find uh, my port of SQL Lite, uh, which is a work in progress. It works right now, but um, it needs some more work still. 
and there's other, we have other, uh, Simus Corporation has other targets for where we're going to go with this. There are some things left on our to-do list that uh, might make things a little better. My personal favorite is still storing the entries in native format so that there's no decode process at all. But I still get some pushback from certain, certain members of the audience. <laughs> Anyways, none of these things are showstoppers, though. Um, for, for LDAP service, where you traditionally have optimized reads and very low write rates, I think this worked very well. So that's it for my talk. Any questions? So we got to have some good questions here. <laughs> so I realize there's never going to be a replacement for actual field testing and benchmarking in an actual environment, or at least as close as you can get. But I'm wondering if you might have, from your initial development and testing, a gut feeling if there would ever be an installation where the modify rate would be so great as to make BDB or HDB preferred. Uh, let me throw a, a motivating example out there. Might be if there are installations out there that keep track of, say, a last bind time or other similar write frequent attributes. Yes, you're. I mean, you're exactly right. Um, any any situation like that, with the current state of the code, you know, MDB would not be suitable. Okay. It, is there any, uh, do you think that might be based on volume or, and there'd be a tipping point, or you think rule of thumb, if you have that sort of installation, it would probably be just on the face, an HDB preference? Well, um, you know, there's, there's obviously ways around this. All right, I'm, I'm using a pretty slow disk and XFS for these tests. Uh, if you wanted to keep using MDB and you had the resources to throw at it, then okay, put some SSDs on there and don't worry about it. Yeah. Sure. And if I can, one more. Uh, I'm wondering over the course of production run, but I guess in the case of benchmarking, it would be more like a week-long run, if uh, any impact on checkpointing, I assume it has to get flushed to disk eventually, not just it shut down, just for power failure and other operational issues. And how does that stack up against the Sleepy Cat store? Um, oh, for checkpointing, huh? The, the overhead is actually less um, in general. Uh, if, you know, if, you set, if you set equal frequencies for checkpoints between Berkeley and MDB, I, I think you're going to find that the volumes are uh, a little bit less with us. Thank with you. MDB. You know you said that the write performance was the bit which was limiting your modified stuff. Have you considered actually batching up writes, so delaying them for a very small time to increase your throughput? Yes. In fact, first of all, that, that is what we do with slap add right now. Okay, that's why our slap add speed is faster than Berkeley's. All right. um, for runtime operation, I'm not really comfortable with doing that because you know, that means we're going to return success for a write, but we don't actually know if it's... Chap, so you, you write five or six writes at a time? Yeah, okay. That's, that's definitely worth uh, thinking about. Uh, one of the things that I observed while testing this is um, okay, one of the reasons that MDB is so fast is that we don't do any mem copies anywhere that we don't need them. Okay. Uh, one of the, the things that I tried to do with the multi-threaded indexer was batch up index updates. But in order to batch them, that means you're copying them from where they were into this buffer. And then later on, when you dump the batch to, uh, to the database, you, know, you, you spit them all out again. And it turns out that that's actually enough to slow it down, that, uh, that you don't get any gain.
Do you already have a plan when this MDB engine will be part of official Open Elder Bridges? Uh, I've got a lot of people asking for it in 2.4.27. We'll see what happens. Um, it, it might certainly, you know, if if we can get it out there early and get a lot of people's feedback, uh, you know, I think that'd be good all around. So we'll see. Have you tested this with sync REPL turned on, Howard? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's part of uh, the standard build now. You know, run make test against it. It does all of the sync REPL tests. Have you benchmarked it? I mean, would those would be inserts, right? Yeah. Everything finishes faster on backend DB, <laughs> as far as as far as our test suite goes. So um, reads are faster, modify or inserts are faster, but modifies so any which is changing an attribute, right? So right. Pa so like password policy things, if if you know users changing passwords and and that those would be the concerns, right? <laughs> those kinds of areas. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, let's talk about that a little differently. Um, Back MD writes are actually relatively fast. Okay, the the thing that slows down the throughput is that only one is allowed at a time. Okay, so you know back BDB or HDB has a higher throughput because it allows multiple writes to be concurrent. Those writes actually complete slowly, but many of them are in flight at once. So, you know, like for the test suite where we have mostly single threaded operations, those things finish very quickly. Uh, where we're doing multi threaded uh, heavy concurrency writes, then, then you see the slowdown. Right. Um, the Results are pretty impressive. Have you tried to um, change the size of the data that you're dealing with uh, during the benchmark, like um, larger entries or even groups? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, most of these tests were run with uh, three or four different test LDIFs. All right. So one of them is, is a very standard one where all the entries are identical size. Uh, two of them are customer databases, and they're very widely varied sizes. Just just to expand on that point, um, in Berkeley DB, you know, large entries and large objects tend to be to have a very high performance cost. Right? Uh, in MDB, they actually have, as far as the database is concerned, they're the same cost as any other item. Um, when Berkeley DB has to put a large object in the database, it uh, sp spills it onto overflow pages. Right? Uh, each overflow page has its own header. And Berkeley DB has to glue the actual data out of each page back into one object. In MDB, only the first data page has a header, and everything else is just contiguously splatted out. So when we return a large object, all we have to do is return a pointer to the beginning, which is the same as returning a pointer to a small object. So there's, there's no cost difference there. Just continuing the subject of groups for a moment as a, a very common, very large attribute, um, have you brought over the special group handling code for making the, the large groups efficient? That's all in the front end, so we got it for free. Um, Howard, um, if you enable change log on the servers, so you're actually recording a change log, hence effectively serializing the Berkeley DB updates, would the performance be basically similar? Yeah. So in many deployments, you, 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 you're effectively going to be serialized if you have the change log turned on. That's true, yeah. And one thing I was wondering, since you do have the 
separated backend library uh, where there are hooks or at least a eye towards transaction support to uh, full commit rollback, et cetera, for future work in LDAP transactions. Oh, that's okay. You're talking about LDAP level transactions because right. this, this library is fully transactional. Uh, well, that's part of what I was wondering is it would it still has all the hooks necessary. I was wondering if it was written, purpose written without an eye towards that or. No, no. it's basically, you know, it's, uh, it's written to provide all the features of Berkeley that we needed, which include transactions. Any more questions? Okay, well, th thank you, Howard.